Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, do you feel bossed around?、Uh, I'm sure you do. If、uh, the comments we get on the programs are anything to go by over the past year,、um, if you do, then there is a great book that you must read.、Uh, it's called "Stop Bloody Bossing Me About." It's by Quentin Letts,、uh, who is my guest today.、Uh, he's also written "Fifty Pe- People Who Buggered Up Britain" and. Patronising bas- bastards. So、uh, this is,、uh, if you like, the third in the series.、Um, Quentin Letts, of course, is political sketch writer for the Times and indeed the theatre critic for the Sunday Times. Thanks very much for coming in, Quentin. Thank you.、Um, we are recording this in the week during which some restrictions are coming off, apparently, of COVID.、Uh, are you surprised at how we have? Sort of basically been quite happy to be bossed around during this period. Yes, completely amazed、yeah. by how pathetic we've been, and we've caved in, we've collapsed. And I thought that the、uh, Brits, I thought particularly the Irish and the Scots, would be much more、yeah. resistant to being bossed around by London. But、um, no, we've been terribly compliant, and we've worn these ghastly masks, and we've done what、uh, Matt Hancock has told us. God, Hancock annoys me, and、uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just that sort of,、uh, sort of. He's like the young David Frost, telling us what to do, and、um, it's been a really salutary lesson. This because we perhaps understand a little bit more now how authoritarian regimes in the past、yeah. have got away with things. We've always been able to pride ourselves. Oh, we we would、yeah. never stand for that, but、yeah. actually, we have we have stood for it. Yes. It, the book I should add I mean, is humorous. It's, it's written in a light-hearted way, but the themes in it are the ones we've talked about on this channel for two years. I mean, essentially, it covers COVID and it covers all the restrictions, but it also covers the woke agenda and all of these kind of、yeah. restrictions and. Privations being put on people. You've been talking about it, Peter, and no one's been paying attention. No, because I mean that's the, that's the frustrating thing. All these things are so lunatic.、Yeah. Um, you and I would think, and yet they've been a- taking root. Yes. yes, and they've been taking root partly because there is this bossocracy, which I talk、mm. about in the book, which is sort of the boss class,、mm. the people in control,、mm. who are、um, doing these things not necessarily because they are driven by a moral agenda. But because it, because they make money out yeah, of it,、yeah. and there are a lot of people who are doing very nicely、yeah. out of bossing us around. So who's making money out of it? Well, if you look at the whole health and safety regime, now I am not one of those people who says health and safety per se is a dreadful thing. I can see on building sites, absolutely essential that you have health and safety. Terrible records on safety at work that there were have been improved thanks to health and safety. But there is undoubtedly a class of consultants and of ninnies who、yeah. are making tremendous livings out of. Uh, running、um, courses for people. I once went on. A, I was doing a panorama program. I went on a ladder course, a course on teaching you how to use a ladder.、No. And、uh, you know the price of this thing was quite high. Yes. And、uh, it was terribly funny. The man taking the course, showing us how to use a ladder, went up the thing and he hit his head on the ceiling. <laughs> We weren't allowed to use that. The BBC wouldn't let us use the footage because it would be unfair on the man. <laughs> It's pathetic. I, I, and I, I think there is this this class of. People who enjoy t- talk,、uh, bossing us around, but also who are making big loot out of it. And if you look at the theatre world, for instance, and the whole、uh, issue of colour blind casting, there are people making big money in the consultancies, doing consultancy work for the Arts Council, who are making much more money than the black yeah, actors、yes. they're meant to be helping. You actually had a bit of a run in on that front, didn't yeah, you? I did. With the Royal Shakespeare Company, can you explain what happened there?、Uh, there was a show they had、um, at the RSC in Stratford, where one guy was really badly miscast. He was meant to be playing a 17th-century Hoori Henry in England,、yes. a chinless wonder,、yeah. and he was just hopeless at doing it. He had no comic、uh, panache. I thought it needed somebody like a sort of a Rick Mail figure.、Mm. And uh, uh, the the thing about this guy was, I thought perhaps he'd been cast because he was black. Because there is undoubtedly there is pressure yeah, on yeah.、Mm-hmm. subsidised theatre、mm-hmm. companies、mm-hmm. to increase the number of minority actors. And I thought, well, hang on, that's not right. If they're casting a bloke simply because of his colour,、mm. that's actually rather racist. They should、mm-hmm. have found somebody who was good for the role, no matter what colour it was. 
uh, but who was able to do that. So I wrote, I described that in my piece, said, has he been cast simply because he's black? And I was denounced as a, pretty much as a member of the Ku Klux Klan mm. for saying that by the RSC. And uh, it was a pretty unpleasant experience. Oh, yeah. uh, and since then, the RSC has admitted that, um, that pretty much that they do. But do you think do, with... As I, as I alleged, casting people on colour. Well, yes. I mean, but it's sort of one way, isn't it, on the whole? I mean, it's not... You wouldn't have a Showboat or Borg in Bess sort of cast with white characters playing black. Yeah, you wouldn't. I wouldn't want to see that, actually. No, no. no exactly. And I, I mean, you know, undoubtedly, the, the, you know, there's no bad thing to try to yeah. encourage young black actors. Yeah. Great, great idea. But when you do it so clung, clunkily, yes. you are basically, I think, telling off your audience and you're saying to, your, or to the audience, you, you need to suck this up. You, yes. you are racists. Yes. And I don't think they are. I think theatre audience is tremendously enlightened, liberal people, properly mm. liberal. Do you think, I mean, what's your view, for example, on this casting in this Anne Boleyn series of the Black Hat? Well, I'll wait and see it. Yeah. You know, the, the, um, you know, the, 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 the thing about artistic ca about, about casting generally is that it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And there's this thing, a very loose thing called the dramatic truth. And the dramatic truth is basically, does something work? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and does it, mm -hmm. does it thread through and does it convince the audience? Yeah. Yeah. And it might well work. Yes. Um, do you think this bossiness, because when you say, whether it's about casting in the theatre or whether it's about COVID and, and pandemic and, and all of that, um, you know, it's the same sort of thing. People are being told really in a way what to do and think. Do you think it's a class thing? Do you see, is it, the, it seems to me, looking, going through your book, is middle class telling other people and that's, there's been a strong tradition of that in Britain. Probably always been the way. That's probably yes. been the way since Norman days. Yeah. You can trace a lot of bossiness back to, Norm, to the arrival of the Normans in 1066. And you certainly then get the, uh, the Doomsday book, book, book 20 years later, which was the, basically the, uh, the introduction of um, taxation on a much yeah. wider scale and uh, taking note of people's um, uh, uh, ownings and then taxing them accordingly. Uh, there's probably always been an element of class uh, in bossiness, but it's not the old-fashioned sort of toffs versus the uh, the peasants. Yeah, no, no. The no. new class, the new ruling class, are very much, as you say, in the middle. They're the sort of mm. much, tend to be much more urban, tend to be university educated, and uh, enjoy wagging their fingers at people. They get a bit of a kick out of it. And um, but it's I mean, it's so m meaningless. A lot of it. Mm -hmm. If you go to Swindon railway station, Peter, I don't suppose you ever go to Swindon railway station. I but been to that if one. you do, you <laughs> alight at Swindon to change trains to get Nothing onto the Gloucester line. Nothing wrong with Swindon, line. by the way. Fabulous. <laughs> and as you as you descend the staircase, um, you get this automated voice saying, "When on the staircase, please use the handrail." Yeah. Now, why do they need to tell you to use a, a damn yes, handrail? Yeah, yes. uh, it's totally unnecessary. Somebody spent money on that. I bet it cost a few thousand quid. Yeah, yeah. And it's just this sort of the tone of the voice, sort of pinched little voice telling you off. Yes. And it really, it pushed me over the edge. Yes. It makes me sound like a lunatic. But I just thought, was, I got so cross about that, that tinny voice telling me what to do. Yes. But it's also <laughs> a, a, another side to that is, is all these signs we're seeing on transport now, be kind. Have you seen these? To be kind, you know, just be kind to people. That again, <laughs> it's just like, how, dare, I mean, how dare you suggest that I'm not kind? You know, can't I make my own mind up? Well, why do we have to be kind? What's wrong with being grumpy occasionally and telling people to, to get lost? Yes, yes. You know, that doesn't happen enough, perhaps. Perhaps we need to tell these people, perhaps we need to be less kind right. to, the, to the bossocracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I say a middle class, I also suppose that there is a big part of this which is very Puritan, is it not? I mean, do you think that there is a kind of Puritanism around now? There is, undoubtedly. Thou shalt not drink mm. has become the 11th commandment. And um, there was a select committee one time at which the chief medical officer, Sally Davies, who was the predecessor of, um, uh, of, of Dr. Whitty, she was being asked about the drinking laws and about the units. Yeah. I bet you, I bet you drink too much, Whittle. Uh, oh, anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, she was asked about these these units, and it turned out they'd completely plucked them out of thin air. Yeah, there was no yeah, scientific yeah. or medical basis really yeah. for it. There was just a suspicion that people were enjoying themselves too yes, much, yeah. and therefore they introduced these um, these units. And then Sally Davis, just sweeping them like that, decided that um, units had to be equalised for men and women. 
because previously women were allowed, were told to drink even less than yes. blokes. And she did that simply on the basis of sort of egalitarian purity. Um, and that's driving quite a lot of it too, this uh, sort of shriveling, uh, determined egalitarianism yeah. that dis dislikes difference yes. and dislikes character. And so uh, people are told really basically not to enjoy themselves, not to laugh too much, uh, not to take the mick and um, to conform. Thou shalt conform. Speaking of bossiness, I mean, as a, a theatre critic, you, you've just had a bit of bossiness put your way, haven't you? In the sense that equity <laughs> is now saying, this is the Actors' Union, is saying that basically when you criticise or review a show or drama, whatever, uh, that somehow you've got to bear in mind your privilege, isn't that right? Or your That's or one of the things I think. I didn't actually read, I read an account of this because I'm... Uh, I, I just decided to ignore anything that equity tells me. Mm -hmm. um, but equity were issuing uh, rules, basically, to theatre critics. Mm -hmm. I think they're telling us to be more kind, yeah. uh, not to be um, negative, which is rubbish, of course, if you go to a terrible show. If you go to, I mean, to write a stinker is tremendously good fun. Yeah, and yeah, also, yeah, yeah. the readers love reading a really unkind yeah. theatre review. But also, if you think it is a bad show, you need to be able to say that. Isn't that freedom of speech? Mm. And uh, we were told that we had to be more kind and we had to check our privilege, yeah. uh, whatever it is. Does that mean, I don't know, because because we're, uh, we're white or because we're middle class ourselves? I don't know, but maybe they should check their privilege telling us off. Anyway, but the, the basic problem with their, with equity, the, equities, the, the actors' union telling journalists what to write is that we're journalists, we're not actors. Mm. We owe no loyalty mm. Mm. to actors. We owe allegiance, our allegiance to the reader. And um, so I just ignored it. But it is, it's a bit spooky, I think. It's a bit chilling if the actors union is taking it upon itself to give instructions to critics. Well, it, it's appalling. I mean, in a way, you are in a stronger position. You are theatre critic of the Sunday Times. They, you know, you, you apart from your own, uh, you know, uh, your own thoughts about what you should do and how you should uh, approach it, you have a certain power. But I would have thought that other critics, they are going to be kind of scared into submission, are they? Well, not? nobody seems to. I mean, apart, from, I mean, Toby Young wrote a piece uh, about it, but none of the other critics seem to have complained about it. Now, it may be that they're deciding to ignore this quite rightly, mm -hmm. and they may think quite rightly also that equity is a busted flush. Yeah. But it is a little bit worrying. But to me, it's completely canutish yes. behaviour yeah, yeah. by equity because you can't suppress opinion. You can try to stop certain outlets of opinion, but it'll just arise elsewhere. And now in the days of the internet, that's particularly true. You can't control the, you know, the, the, the press in the, in the way that you used to be able to. So if, um, if some critics suddenly pull their punches and yeah. become very milky, uh, then the readers will just go elsewhere. They will find another critic will pop up who is outspoken, yes. who tells it as it is, and uh, the readers will flock there. And so it's completely pointless behaviour by them. Do you think, uh, the, how do you think the theatre is going to look, or well, actually the general cultural scene, when it kind of comes back, you know, when it reopens? I, I would have thought things are going to change quite a lot. I would have thought we're going to have much more of a kind of identity politics, even more than now, identity yeah. politics. I would have thought, yes. I, I think much less, actually. Really? I think much less because. I, I, first of all, I'm really worried about a lot of theatres. I think a lot of theatres are going to go out of business. COVID has been terrible for them. People have um, been uh, got out of the habit of going to the theatre. Theatre was really throbbing beforehand. Yeah. And now it's in, it's in a terrible state. Um, the government has not got any grasp of the importance of culture. And so I'm worried about the, the future of the theatres. I think the economics are going to be dreadful uh, because the tourists aren't there. Certainly in the in West End theatre I'm talking about is, is going to be really badly hit until, until the tourists come back. As a result of that, when economics become difficult, I think you'll see a flight by producers to much more mainstream, saleable yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think people are going to get away with the, the woke rubbish. Um, now, there's, there, you know, there will still be the subsidised theatre, yeah. of course, which will still do it. But as far as commercial theatre goes, I think they're going to have to do much more uh, poppy stuff. And this goes for all the great 
out of London theatres. I mean, it, it's not just, we're not just talking about the West End here. All these great theatres around the country, Theatre Royal Bath and it's in Newcastle and all these... Well, places. the Theatre Royal Bath is a good example. Their uh, programme for this year is, I'm not going to say that it's, it's less intellectual than it was, but it's a bit less PC... Oh, than it has been same. in previous years. So yeah. I've, I, you know, I, I think that might be the way that things go. But it's hard to say that one's optimistic about it because the theatre sector is really, really hurting. Yeah, and the actors are out of work and the tech people are out of work. It's a miserable scene. In this book, Quentin, you... Actually, a lot of the people that you wrote about, 50 people who buggered up Britain, they kind of make a return. Do in they? This book. Yes, they do. Um, but you've also included in here... Uh, You're calling it a reheat. No, <laughs> no, no. I'm saying it's highly consistent, is what Good I'm point. saying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, a lot of, but with some new people as well, like Ferguson, you know, you, I, he's one of the... Oh, uh, the bonking professor, uh, yes, Professor yes. Lockdown, Professor Pantsdown. Yes. Yeah, well, he's a classic example, isn't he, where he was telling us, or, you know, we all had to keep our social distance. And then, you know, he was hopping into bed with another bloke's wife. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm nothing against that personally, but I think if you're, if you're doing that at the same time as telling yes. people to, to keep a social distance, it's yes. a bit tricky. But uh, another thing as well that I found very interesting, because again, you know, it, you cover so much in this, is you talk about the Chinese social credit system in it as being like, it's almost like the most sinister form of bossiness, isn't it? Yes. Can you explain, actually, because people still might not know how this works, the system. Trying to get my head around the Chinese social credit system, which at the moment is only in its nascent. Yes. Uh, it's a nascent thing. And it may not uh, develop quite the way that we fear. But at the moment in China, if you do certain things, if you prove yourself to be a good citizen, then you can get certain advantages. It's a bit like a sort of... Um, a corporate loyalty card and uh, you will find that if somebody uh, for instance um, uh, it, it, it does certain estimable things for the community then they will get uh, go to the front of the queue when it comes to finding places for their children at school and that sort of thing. Now um, you'd have thought that uh, I as a, an anti-egalitarian would be in favour of that but it's just a little bit creepy the way that authorities are yeah. deciding that certain forms of behaviour yeah. are um, uh, are credit worthy and at the same time if you show dissent then you will find you go to the back of the queue mm -hmm. for certain um, types of, uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of um, public service so therefore I just hope that that doesn't come in here but in a way it's you got know, the feeling hasn't it? it's got this sort of feeling of potential you well it's to it. do what, what this is I suppose it's, it's basically the, for, the state assuming a form of cancel power mm. over people when it comes to issuing basically their rights and mm. their, their public services. Mm. And uh, I just hope that it doesn't come here. But I think more of a problem here, you know, isn't to do with the state being a fount of disapproval. It's to do with private enterprise, with the corporate sector mm. has become completely hypnotized yeah. by cancel culture and by activists. And also in, in the corporate world, you get these codes of conduct. And I do a chapter on this in the book, which I think is a, it's a really chilling thing, where codes of conduct have, have mushroomed in the last 10 years in the corporate sector and also in institutions. And if you're going to be a member of the, the, sort of the, 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 the professional body of engineers, for instance, mm -hmm. you have to sign up to all these, to a code of conduct, mm -hmm. which stipulates you have to be positive and you have to uh, uh, respect your your colleagues and you have to think about pushing out a, a positive uh, idea of your profession and you have to respect equality. Now these things are very much to do with personal opinion and personal mm -hmm. politics and yet these are institutions and um, companies yeah. forcing this on people and if you don't sign up to it then you, po you probably can't work. And that, to me, is a form of credit control yes, in yeah. itself and is greatly to be resisted. And I'd like to see this sort of thing pulled out much more and teased out much more by our pol politicians and parliamentarians. But it's a form of thought control, isn't it? It is. It's basically... Well, it's a, it's a form, not necessarily <clears throat> of thought control, but certainly of action control. Action control. And it's forcing people to sign up to things which they may well not believe mm. in. Mm. Now, if you run a factory in Derbyshire, say... Uh, an engineering factory, why should you sign up to respecting all your 
your colleagues, your yes. rivals. Surely you should be competing with them. Yeah, yes. How do we arrive at this situation, do you think, then, Quentin? Not just because of the pandemic, because a lot of the stuff that you're talking about is really nothing to do with the pandemic, like what you just talked about with companies. How would you say we've ended up, because even 20 years ago, this wasn't the case. Well, I think egalitarianism, it's, it's sort of uh, the, the, um, the nostrum of egalitarianism is basically mm. what's driving all this. But we've also be, become terribly lazy and complacent, haven't we? And we've lost the art of flair and difference. Mm. And people are terribly, people are much more fashion conscious now than they used to be. In an uh, intellectual sense, you mean? Or? Yes, and but also, I, I, don't, I don't mean in terms of clothes. No. I, I mean in terms of attitudes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And uh, but maybe social media is driving a lot of that as well. Um, people used to be, eccentricity is, is dying out, isn't it? Yes, yeah. The Brits used to be much more sparky and nutty. Yes. Uh, and we've now become rather orthodox. Yes. And I think that's a pity. It does feel very much, you know, that there is this kind of... You know, I'm not talking about eccentric. I don't mean people walking around with underpants. No, I know. I know exactly. I mean people having the the ability (laughs) to have the sort of self-confidence to to differ. Well, real free thinkers, if you like, as well. You know, people who just don't go wrong. Bloody minded. Yes. yes. My old dad, my late dad, he was a schoolmaster. He was tremendously eccentric. Uh, And he instilled in his boys, his pupils... um, the idea that there was nothing wrong with you know being your own person, yeah. But that seems to have come away. You, nowadays, we're all being told we have to be part of the team, mm. and I cannot bear it. I cannot bear it when Boris Johnson, of all people, mm. tells us we have to be a member of a team and sort of you know doing our bit. Yes, it's I don't sort want to of, do yes. my bit. Yes, yes. Why should I do my bit for anyone else? It's hard enough paying your own bills, you know. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> actually, you mentioned the clappings thing in the book the nhs oh, did clapping you did you thing. clap um uh, well uh, the first time i sort of as a gesture you I, weed whittle no i found it kind of hard <laughs> to do because it sort of felt it it just felt a bit alien no, to it me felt communist, i mean didn't it it yeah. felt communist it felt north korean yes, yes. um we didn't do it because we uh, we can't hear our neighbors thank goodness but uh, uh and they can't hear us but um I don't know. I mean, it began that that clapping idea was, was quite a nice idea in, originally. Yeah. But then it got warped, didn't it? Yes. It got taken up yeah. as a a thing that you had to do, mm. and there were people being reported to the police by the neighbours uh, for not doing it. And also, then somebody formed a company, and there's now a company which is making money out of it. So, uh, and the public sniffed this out, and they lost enthusiasm for it. And when they were told to clap by the unions, they told them they decided they weren't going to do it. So actually, the even though I've just been saying we aren't eccentric enough and we don't think enough for ourselves anymore, yeah. there is still the British public still have um, en masse they can show dissent. You know, when you mentioned about eccentricity there, or just being simply different, maybe slightly uh, out of kilter, whatever it is, uh, as a sketch writer, parliamentary sketch writer, I already thought. You are you're quite bereft of figures, aren't you? Or like straight, interesting people. Do you remember? I mean, I remember growing up in the seventies, eighties. People like Gerald Nabarro and, and oh, these, the buggers grips. Yeah, yes, yeah, and yeah. on all these kind of very <laughs> colourful figures who didn't really amount to anything in terms of politics, really. But they they populated Parliament. I mean, oh, or, I don't know. I, I'm not quite so gloomy about things. Actually, I think the Parliament at the moment has got quite a few really? highly sketchable people. I mean, Hancock himself is extremely irritating and they're sort of um uh, if somebody's irritating then that makes them sketchable in a way but michael goes is a, is a glorious piece of work he's he's got lots of curlicues and uh, cornices on him that you can uh, you can describe uh, boris um is pretty good good for i mean angela rayner on the labor side mm. tremendous for our business and uh, there are actually quite a few around so i'm not quite as gloomy about that what right. what um the uh, the really boring parliament sketch was the was Blair's big majority parliament, when a lot of people had come into politics who had no idea they were ever going to make it to parliament. Yeah. In that ninety seven landslide, yeah. a lot of real a lot of dross washed up, and um, a little bit of that has happened this time with the big Tory majority, but not quite as much. And there there there's still you know there's still some pretty good uh, figures. 
I thought actually Desmond Swain. So Desmond Swain. De- oh yes, uh, but, uh, is is a corker. But he sort of stood out <laughs> for the very reason that it was so unusual to see a Tory like that these days. I mean, you know, he was like an old-fashioned sort of backbench Tory that you maybe last would have seen in Thatcher's years. I thought this bossiness. Uh, finally, uh, Quentin, when do you think what's going, what will stop it? Right, whether it. I don't mean coming out of the uh, lockdown or anything like that, but this general drift that we have, what what do you see? Do you think we are going to re-enter a kind of wonderfully free and, and less bossy period? Or is it just inevitable it will just get worse? Well, I don't know. It, it's, I think, a calamitous recession yeah. uh, might well bring about a reappraisal because I think that would make... The uh, it would make it impossible for the state to employ quite yeah. so many of these um, these irritating people. Yes. yes. Um, uh, but with uh, social media, it's hard to it's hard to drive a difference because there is so much conforming going on. Mm. Now it may be that the social media thing will peak. Certainly, that the big social media companies will peak, and I think you get a sense of that already. I think Facebook is probably on on the, the downward slope in yeah. terms of its influence now. Twitter is, I think. So that's that's quite promising. But what's going to change it? The human spirit eventually will change it. Mm. Um, but if we haven't got it at the moment with Boris as PM, and imagine how much worse it would be if we'd had Jeremy Hunt in charge. Oh, yes. Uh, so, uh, I mean, Boris <laughs> has been a terrible disappointment in these respects. Yes. But um, you know, it, it could have been worse. Yes. Um, OK, well, just wanted to finally ask you one thing. It sounds a bit like clickbait while we're talking on social, about social media, but um, Meghan and Harry have been in the news a lot lately. <laughs> Isn't this a perfect example of bossiness, you know, from a de haut en bas, as it were, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Harry, Harry has, has completely blown himself up, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I think, I mean... Uh, the the Harry story is um, is a great reason to be optimistic, and so was that. By the way, was the uh, the report of that British race report. Oh, uh, and that was a great one. example yeah. of of yeah. how the the bossocracy ha- have are losing their grip. I think. But Harry, I mean, you just have to look at that, and and surely anyone who's running a company or who's launch about to launch a product will want to run uh, a thousand miles from that sort of attitude. Yes. And just look at how badly it's going down. Yes. And, you know, it's, he's become a great example of how not to do it. Exactly. And who would you rather have dinner with? Would you rather have dinner uh, with, um, with Prince Harry or Prince Andrew? I mean, it's a terrible choice. You know, well, <laughs> you'd, yeah. you'd rather... Oh, yeah, well, that's I'm, a tough one there. <laughs> yeah. leap, off a, leap off a cliff. But actually, Prince Andrew would be more fun. Yes. Just. I think I I think <laughs> I'll go with the Queen. Actually, that's the safe option. I think probably. But Quentin, thank you so much for coming in to talk to us. Um, the book, by the way, again is "Stop Bloody Bossing Me About" by Quentin Letts. Available in well, when the bookshops are open now, aren't they? Of course, on Amazon. And uh, thank you very much indeed. And maybe see you in a few months' time if you come back. It'd be great. Thank you very much. Uh, that's it for so what you're saying is this week. Uh, so we shall see you next time and. In the meantime, please do remember to click that subscribe button, won't you? Thanks very much. Bye-bye.